objects, how you see objects. And before we do that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my personal history and why I'm sitting in a wheelchair, because it has bearing on today's lecture. Um, about 12 years ago, I, I was feeling some pains in the heart while I was preparing a lecture at home. And so I decided, well, maybe just to be on the safe side, I should get closer to UH. So, um, and I figured rather than, um, I usually bike down, so, but I thought maybe given the circumstances, I, maybe walking down would be safer. And so I, I walked to, to my, my office and um, by lunchtime, the, the pain was still there. So I asked the secretary to cancel, I think it was this class. And I walked into UH and, you know, checked myself into emergency. And I lay there in the, in the stretcher for six hours and they were prodding and trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Couldn't find a thing. Um, and um, just about that time, um, I, I just passed out. And they thought, well, maybe this is serious. So they took me for a CAT scan quickly and then discovered that my, what happened was that my aorta had ruptured. And for the last six hours, blood had been pouring into my chest. And uh, it ran out of blood. So they quickly rushed me to surgery and, and put a, uh, re repaired my aorta with a, a Dacron um, sleeve. And, um, but unfortunately, uh, having run out of oxygen for such a long time, and the aorta, as it ruptures, there's little arteries that feed the spinal cord, and they had been uh, ruptured during the, during the rupture. And my spinal cord had run out of oxygen. So when I came to a week later, because I'd been in a coma for, for a week, um, I discovered that I was paralyzed. But uh, that wasn't all. I discovered that, um, that I had trouble recognizing faces, even the faces of my family, as they walked in the room after uh, this darkened room. So um, that was a, a worry. And then later on, when, when, when I had been um, up um, for several days, I discovered I had difficulty telling the time from an analog watch, like this face or the one in the back of the room. I could read numbers. That was fine. But I couldn't make out the meaning of where all the arrows went. Couldn't sort of put, out, put together the geometry. Now, one of the things I'd been studying uh, at that time was a structure that I'll talk to you about today called LOC. And that's, and I study it by doing fMRI experiments. And I put myself or other students into the magnet and we figure out what this LOC was doing. Um, and my, I was trying to rush the, the people and I, I was still in ICU for three weeks. And I tried to rush them, march myself out for an, an hour into my magnet <laughs> and see what was wrong with my LOC. Because you'll see in a moment that it has bearing on the case. Uh, but they wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Anyways, um, I, I was then transferred. I, um, I recovered well, but, you know, the problem was I still because my spinal cord has been damaged, I couldn't walk. So they shifted me over to Parkwood for rehab. I stayed there for about three months. Um, and um, yeah, one of the things also that, 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 that besides the LOC problem, which I should point out disappeared. So um, within about three, four weeks, I could again tell time from an analog watch. The, brain is a remarkable structure that it, it can recover very quickly. Um, it, some parts of it can. If, 
if it has that plasticity. Um, but it's still, I, I, there was one part that um, has stayed with me for 12 years, and that's a little scotoma in my V1, at the posterior end of my left V1. And so I can't see, but in addition to regular blind spot, I have a one that's just over to where the next word would be. So it makes reading, jump, jumping to the next word in a sentence difficult. Because I can't place my, my, my saccade correctly, my eye movement correctly. Um, but, uh, and, and so I was worried that there were other things wrong with me besides just uh, the inability for a while to recognize clocks and, and not be able to see. But um, gradually my, my children helped by uh, forcing me to play chess constantly get my brain working again. And, and that year, I, uh, the, the next, that fall, the next fall, I again taught this course. And um, the, for some odd reason, the students liked me more than ever. And um, they um, nominated me and I won a teaching prize that year. And then another one for another course I taught. And I couldn't figure that out, but I think this, the reason for that is that I had discovered it's best to slow down. You know, I guess I, I used to get through these lectures a lot faster than I do now. And going through things more carefully is a good idea. So I've been in a wheelchair now for 12, 12 uh, years, and I've retired for two, and I spend a lot of time working on this, these courses, this course. I still want to teach it for as long as I'm able. And um, the rest of the time I, I work on um, carvings, so wood carvings, um, and writing textbooks, converting uh, my course notes into textbooks. Okay, so let's find out what this area LOC does. We saw that the information first went to this V1 area here at the, along the calcri, this fold in the brain. But if we look, we can see on both sides of it, an area called V2, and another one around that called V3. And if I turn the head, so now you're looking at, at the outside of it. So this is, this is the front, this is the back, and you can see these areas come around it, like like ribbons. I'm going back, you can see, again, that the medial side, where we see the calcrine, there's very little V1 visible, because it's all in that fold. So when we blow up the brain, we can see this is V1 again unfolded. And when we rotate this line round and round and round, you can see that, that not, it's not just one line that appears, but now we've got three lines appearing in V1 and then V2 and then V3. Um, now, if you look at that, they're, they're, they're doing sort of crazy patterns. And what's, what's the rhyme reason for these patterns? Well, you can, let's look at one line. Just stop one line here. And this is just below horizontal. Okay. So where would we expect to find this line in V1? Well, we'd expect to find this line. There's the calcrine in the dashed line, just above the calcrine. That's where we find the horizontal line. Now, surprisingly, we find another line in V2 over here and another line in V3 over here. And they're almost touching each other. Okay. So, they're, again, they're touching at this border. They're meeting at this border. Now, if we look at another line, this is a vertical line heading down. So this one, again, we find somewhere above the calcrine because it's somewhere down here. 
So again, we find that along the edge of V2 now, or V1 meets V2. And now we find, find another line at this close edge in V2, right against this one. So rather than, and this line here, rather than it being over here, it's, meet, it's at the very far edge of V3. So before the two lines met here, bumped into each other here, now they're bumping into each other here. Now this is this is kind of neat because what it does is helps you define where the borders of V1, V2, and V3 are in a normal human being. So if you were going to test people and and want to do find out where what V2 is doing, what V3 is doing, you can use these markers these visual markers, to determine where the borders lie. Now, again, what, why, why are they doing this? Well, one way to explain it is to look at what this arrow does. So this, this time we have an arrow, not, 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 not going straight down or not going right straight across, but coming down here, sort of in, your, in, in your, the middle of your uh, periphery, and find out where it's projecting in here. Well, here it starts at the horizontal, this arrow, and it goes to the vertical. So, from what we saw before, it starts at the calcarine and goes to the very peripheral edge of V1, okay, because that's where we saw a vertical line being mapped just a moment ago. And then we find, again, that there's the vertical line. So we'd expect another vertical line um, over here. So that's where the, the, the arrow tip is, is, is placed. And now over here, we've got the tail another tail over here. So what's happening here is you have the arrow and the mirror of the arrow, another mirror of the arrow. So they're doing flipping the arrow back and forth. And the reason is they're doing that is that that allows cells that represent the arrow head to be near cells that represent the arrow head here. And similarly, cells that represent the tail here are near cells that represent the tail here. Now, why does that happen? What, what's the reason for that? Well, here again you have this arrow, and it, the arrow is connects, let's say, um, well, not the arrow, but, but you can imagine a cell here being connected from V1 to a cell in V2. Another cell here from a cell in V1 to V2. And over here. So what's happening here is, is, is these connections are formed. So signals here go to here, signals here go to here, signals here go to here. So we have these axons developing. And these axons develop, develop early in life. And one theory is that these axons act sort of as, as pulleys. And they pull these two folds close together. And uh, by doing so, they make these axons short. And thus speed up the transmission of information and minimize how much distance these, these things have to travel and the number of action potentials or the, 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 the distance these action potentials have to travel. Um, and so one theory is that this is the reason for all the folding of the brain besides trying to put lots of stuff into a, a spherical shape. Now, what do are, what are these areas do? Well, in these areas, these higher areas, what they're doing is trying to assemble simple features like lines, which we saw V1 cells and end stop cells, um, simple, simple and end stop cells in V1 doing, 
and they're trying to um, combine them into whatever the, the, the brain thinks belong together. So the, the brain might decide that these four lines belong in a box, whereas this fifth line belongs somewhere else, maybe in the background. And how does it do that? Well, one theory is the following, that initially you just laid up these cells in V1. Um, you know, this is one simple cell, this is another, this is another, another. So you have these, all these simple cells, and they're all firing at their separate rates. So there's no order in which these cells are firing. At some point, when the brain decides that these belong together, it does this. So you can see the four cells that, that represent the box are starting to fire together at the same time, synchronously. And this fifth cell that represents this line that doesn't belong to the box fires at some other time. So this is called binding. Um, and and, and what, what's happening here is that there's an input from V1 to V2, V2 to V3, and um, at some point in time, uh, the brain, these areas decide that it's good to combine these things together, and you develop synchronous activity. And then there's a feedback from V3 back to V2, from V2 back to V1, and this accentuates. So if, they, if these guys are firing together, then the feedback will come back to the, to, to it, it, synchronously as well. And that, over a few short, uh, short time, will develop into this, this synchronous activity, that feedback. OK. So some things like a box were easy to tell, which would the, it was easy for the brain to figure out what parts belong together. Now, this is something that's a little more difficult, and you might have to stare at it from some time to recognize that these this figure represents two drafts. There's one head here, another head here, and then the neck coming down this way, and a neck coming down this way, and there's a couple of feet over there. Now, in, in, in normal everyday view of giraffe is that they're seen against a background of a different color. And you can see how once you put in color these cells that are in V2 and V3 that are trying to decide what belongs to what have a much easier time putting things together. And there's, there's other cues besides color. One other cue is memory. So you can see um, when, 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 when there's a brief flash of color, you can, from the memory, remember what, 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 what elements belong together. And if you looked at this for a long enough time, you'd come back the next day and still be able to pop out those graphs easily. Here's another example of an interesting phenomenon. So you can see here um, the, the, these, this, this um, wedge in each of these spheres or circles. You can see that when, when these wedges are all over the place, really nothing comes together. But when these wedges are like that, okay, you can suddenly see a square appear. And if you look carefully, you can imagine there's a line here when the four squares all line up, okay? And the four wedges line together. Um, this line here seems to produce the illusion of a line coming right across. And if you look even more carefully when these wedges are in the right alignment, you feel you see a little color here, a shading of greenish or bluish, whatever color you see here. 
so that's another example. There's, there are these end stop cells that we talked about. They feed into V2 and V3, and they give you this. Some they fire when there's no not necessarily a line here, but a line over here and a line over here, and they come. They, they combine these two lines and have an illusion of a line. And then I can, I also mentioned that you might see a color. And that color comes from here. It actually just comes from this edge. Because as we saw, um, um, cells that, 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 like if this was a double opponent cell, looking at this big green area here, a blue area, um, the center and surround will cancel and very little activity. It's only at the edges with the double opponent signal that there's a color. So somehow the information from the edge, when, it, when you reassemble a thing into a square, travels into this inside, filling it in. Now, a lot of things that we see, as I mentioned, are based on our memory. We saw the giraffes better when the colors indicated where the giraffes were. But other things like the faces we see, the letters we see, also uh, are dependent on memory. So we have an idea, for example, of how we spell the word example. And the letters we do see at that moment are interpreted. The brain interprets it based on our memory. And you sort of have this top-down influence, so you, so you think you see what you don't really see. So here, if you look at this word here, you may not notice right away that it's misspelled. That's the main cause of, of misspelling. You look at the beginning, you look at the end, and you miss the thing in the middle. Now, there's another example. If you look at this, so it, 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 at first it makes no sense, but then if you say, try reading it out loud, according to an English university study, I guess a study, the order of letters in the word doesn't matter. The only thing that's important is the, the first and last letter of every word. So it's neat how the brain sort of takes the first letter and the last letter and fills in the word in the middle. Okay. Where does the... So we have V1 going to V2 going to V3. Um, where does it go from there? Well, you can see here that it separates and heads up one to the parietal lobe and the other to the inferior temporal lobe. And this pathway that's traveling up is called the wear stream. And this pathway traveling down is called the what stream. Now, so again, this is the back of the brain. This over here is the front of the brain. This is the bottom. That's the top. Now, within all these areas, there are, it's a multitude of areas that receive visual information. Um, at the last count, uh, there was something like 36 of them, but the numbers quickly multiply as we find out more and more areas can be divided into, let's say, two or three other areas. We're really composed of several areas. And so you can imagine that you're, what you, what's going on in your brain right now is that you have something like a, 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 the, the thing at Masonville, the multiplex theater, and you've got movies playing inside your head on these multiple theater, uh, uh, screens. 
The only thing that's different between the multiplex and your brain is that every screen in your brain, all 36 of them, are playing the same movie. There's, but the different, each area, each screen, is slightly different. Some screens are looking at all the motion that's occurring in the scene. Other screens are looking at the texture and all kinds of other attributes that we've yet to discover. So we see um, down here an area that's involved in processing the edges of colors of objects. And the one over here is looking at the spatial attributes of things, finding out where they are, their location, their orientation. So we'll, this pathway up here, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this more in a future lecture. Uh, it's this pathway down here that we'll concentrate <coughs> now. So this area here is involved in sort of recognizing ab objects. And what a good, good example is faces, and we'll go into detail detail of that in a moment. Now, we begin in V1, and, and so in V1, we recognize lines. And then over here, we start recognizing the combination of all those features, the lines, the colors, and whatnot. And we discovered that they would have put them together into a particular phase. Now, how does the, what are the steps in doing that? Well, first, this V1 separates the top and bottom of things. So the top, the bottom of, of, of an object is represented here. The top of an object in V2 is separated here, some distance apart. And the same in, the v, in V3. There's a structure here called the lateral occipital cortex that starts putting these halves or quarters back together again. So in this structure here, the, so we, we have things in, the, in this quadrant combining with this quadrant, but not yet the left and right sides. So we have, again, in V1, these spokes and these blobs. Here we, we're looking at the edges of things. Here we're looking at the colors. And as we go into higher areas, um, we start assembling these objects. So the, 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 these lines of, or here be, begin, the brain begins to see that they're oriented in the same direction. So it starts combining these edges, making them longer and longer. You can see how this line here gets co combined. So it passes through these various um, columns, and these columns are being fed to V2, and those columns are being fed to V3, and it decides that this, this is forming an edge. And that edge then extends around this, this rhino. Now, when we have a lesion in this area called LOC, we have the inability to recognize any object, including faces. Um, and then we have, when we have a, a, a small lesion down here, um, we have agnosia for particular objects, such as just faces. So it's going here, every object, <coughs> Is, is unrecognizable. A can of Coke, uh, a, a, a mouse, a face. Here, it's particular objects that start disappearing. So my problem when I came out of the coma looks like it was over here because I had trouble recognizing both the clock face and the real face. Mm -hmm. 
So let's do uh, an experiment that um, these two scientists um, did some time ago. And the, the question, they asked the subjects two questions. And I'll ask you those two questions now as well. I'll click on this and a bunch of faces will appear. And your task is to hit the table as hard as you can. When the two faces, one face, two faces follow in sequence. So you see a face, that's the same face you just saw before. Okay? So let's start. Get ready. Good. Okay, so let's now do something else. So, I'm going to ask you another question. Now your task is, doesn't matter whose face it is, but is it in the same place you just saw? Okay. Great. Good. So if you saw this thing, if you, as you were, all were concentrating on location, it is this pathway that was being activated in your cortex. If I was to stick you into the magnet in, in, in Robarts, this whole area would light up. If I asked the previous question, this area down here would light up. Now, the stimulus is exactly the same. All we're asking the brain is, is to focus in on two different questions, two different tasks. And we, we, now, the fMRI measures blood flow. Um, that's all it does, measure blood flow to tiny, tiny, one millimeter by one millimeter little cube. So it can measure at the resolution of, of, of less than the thickness of the cortex. And it can tell you whether this part of the cortex is, is, is being shunted blood or another part of the cortex is being shunted blood. Um, and then from that, it can say, okay, this part of the cortex needs blood, and therefore it must be active. Now, if um, these two streams do exist, then we should find patients that uh, has, have selected lo losses of one or the other, and this indeed is the case. So we have lesions here. We, we have patients that have difficulty in pointing or grasping. And we'll look at more of those cases in, in one of the next lectures. If on the other hand, we have lesions down here, we have re, le, problems in, in, in vi, visual agnosia of some type. And this, in particular, this type of agnosia you can find is something called prosopagnosia. We'll cover that in more detail in a moment. You're an inability to recognize faces. So, this lady, Nancy Kenwisher, discovered that there's a little tiny place called the fusiform face area that when you just show faces, lights up. So down here in the inferior part of the temporal sulcus, we find a tiny area that likes faces. And um, if you locate a neuron, you find it's very particular to a particular face. And that these form clusters you know, columns one next to each other, all that prefer that face. Now, if you have lesions of that area, you have prosopagnosia, and we'll show you a patient towards the end of the lecture um, that has this problem. Not, not a patient, it's actually um, uh, a normal person that at least appears normal. Um, but the amazing thing about it is that if you can't 
without that lesion, you can't recognize your friends. You can't even recognize yourself in a mirror. So imagine going off to, let's say, Loblaws with a friend. And uh, you get separated. And then you say, okay, we'll meet at the cash counter. And you, you, you go to the cash counter and, and you see this crowd of people. You can't recognize them from your face. Okay. You start, have, to, have to start remembering other cues. Well, okay, that color hair, I think that he or she was wearing that color sh shirt. And, and it's, it's a longer process. Um, th there's a, um, uh, there's a nice um, article in the FYI section of the, of li the links to of this man who couldn't recognize his wife and the problems he had had. But you can still re recognize the element, so you can look at the face and recognize, okay, that's a nose, that's an eye, that's an eyebrow. You know, no, no problem recognizing the element, but you just can't put them together into a, a particular face. Okay, the eyebrows are that close together. Okay, that for you and me, uh, that uh, the, the distance the eyebrows would give you sort of recognition of familiarity, or the shape of the nose, all those things, the, the width, the position of it. Anyways, so within the inferior temporal cortex, um, including FFA, you have cells that prefer different objects. So, for example, this one here um, doesn't particularly like a rhino, but loves a lion, but doesn't like a giraffe. And there are other, you know, examples as well. Now, in this area, okay, in 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 in, else, in an area near L, uh, fusiform face area, but in the inferior temporal cortex, the position of this lion is irrelevant. So this cell will fire no matter where the uh, lion is on the retina. Okay, in LOC we saw it only fired when it's when when it's on one side of LOC. And on the opposite side, on the other LOC. It doesn't matter what size the object is. Okay. And it doesn't matter whether that, that object is de demarcated by just an outline, or by a color, or by texture. The important thing is that if this texture must have an edge. If this was a, a plain texture throughout, nothing would light up. Okay. Even in LOC, nothing would light up because this is an object. And notice this. this these are just it's like a texture when it stops but forms a lion when it's moving. You can look at it carefully and see the lion, and then when it stops, it gradually fades away because your brain loses the ability to tell, okay, like, this lion belongs to a lion, this one doesn't. So, in the inferior temporal cortex, the, so these, these two objects look similar in V1, but light up very different cells in, in the inferior temporal cortex. But like this part of the um, rhino and this part of the lion would light up very similar cells in V1. And same thing with this back leg here and this back leg here. But, when, but very different cells in the IT. So these images are look like very different things, but they light up the, the very same cell. And it's remarkable, like you can look through the, all these photographs and immediately 
recognize who that person is. And it takes you less than 100 milliseconds if you time yourself to figure that out. So it's a very fast circuit. Um, and, it, and you can sort of discover or, 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 or understand that this, um, this is Obama um, from all these varieties of views. And so that, that gives you a hint of what meaning is, you know. When, when it's, it's difficult to define, but in part, it's your ability to identify objects from all these very different views that we one would see. So in IT, you again have columns, like everywhere else in brain, but within these columns, you have different things represented. So all these different parts of letters and then faces, different views of the same face. And these th views can be put, over, put together over time. So when you see a picture of someone, you actually o only see it in detail with the fovea. So imagine that when you're looking at that picture, you, this is what your fovea sees. You know, this nose, this, these lips, these eyes. And based on where it's looking, it puts together the whole picture of the person and then sees this as a whole. But in real life, you don't see each of the details here. You're just remembering these details because your phobia is not on the nose at this moment and not in the eyes. But this is the ensemble is what you see. So this picture of my daughter, way back 40, almost 40 years ago, Okay, the other thing that, that this area does, it distorts things. This is the watch screen. And what it does is distort things. So I want you to, this, you can see here two lines, one here and one over here. Let me know when the two lines, I'll shorten the one, of, the one in, in, in closer to you, and I'll, you tell me, hit your, again, the head of the table as hard as you can, when they're all, of the same length. Okay? No? 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 A few? Come on. Gotta... Okay, let's see. That's pretty close. But I would I would have said Something back here would be look to be about equal, and that's very very distant. So some of you, the ones that didn't click the table, are good at drawing because when you draw something, your your brain tells you that uh, distorts the length of these two lines, and. The reason is that it, the brain knows that that window there is a rectangle, okay? That the front line and the back line are exactly of the same length. And so the what stream sees that, sees that as a window. And in windows, this is what happens. But when you're drawing, you have to, again, draw things in perspective. So you've got to ignore what your what stream is telling you and draw things accurately in terms of their real length, not what their illusory length is. Okay, another example of how things get changed in view one. Now you would think, you probably tell that this might be Mona Lisa. But when I turn it around, there's something odd about her, right? Look, looks quite normal when she's upside down, but this way it's, she's frowning and her eyes are, look funny. And why is that? Why can we recognize things 
when they're upright and have a lot of difficulty recognizing when they're upside down. Well, one theory is that in your brain you have to store them as in, 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 in a certain form. And, and you store them in the form of an object. And that object has an up and a left and a front. Okay? And when you see this picture, it's very easy for the eyes in this picture to look for a correspondence in your memory of what Mona Lisa looked like. Okay? When you see the smile, you can look at these lips and see, is that the same as the memory of what, what Mona Lisa like, looked like? But here, it's more difficult. It's more difficult to turn these eyes around and de determine whether they correspond to what your memory remembers Mona Lisa as looking like. And maybe it just, just takes practice to do so. So just to summarize, um, you have the visual stream dividing into an action stream, which we'll talk about in, in the next lecture. Not the next lecture, but a next lecture, and the what stream. And um, the what stream is interested in where what an object is, whereas an, um, the where stream, the location of an object. And the the other thing about the, the where stream is that it gets most of its information from the peripheral retina. Remember those ganglion cells, those large ganglion cells, with um, ill-defined uh, edges, whereas the fovea sees things in detail, and that's what the watch stream looks at, to recognize whatever, what you're seeing is a, a face or another object. We'll see later that the two sides aren't equal, that one side is more visual, and the other side is more verbal. Um, and we'll see one, that one reason for that is that this FFA, for example, uh, that used on this side primarily to recognize faces, over here, the back end of it is being taken over to recognize words. And so it's, words are over here and, and, and faces are over here, and being able to put a face in the uh, and then it, the person's name together becomes difficult. Okay.